welcome back, and we have Tim Alexander, who's normally on our third hour, but also pops in with emergency reports all the time, also closes up their blog daily, and is on our live stream channel as our major co-host. Uh, Tim, this attack is the third attack uh, that we can attribute to the Israelis, the Fordo attack in Iran. I have very good reliable reports. At least 200 to 240 people were trapped, almost certainly Russian scientists and technicians, at the Fordo centrifuge plant near Qum, the holy mountain in Iran. We have now the attack by Israel against the so-called chemical and biological weapons plants outside the outskirts of Damascus, Syria. Uh, what was the third uh, area of attack? Well, the, uh, the Lebanese attack within the last 24 hours, 12 fighters uh, entered uh, Lebanon, and they struck actually just on the Syrian side of the border. Uh, they were moving, uh, initially they, they tried to say they were moving uh, chemical warheads. They weren't. They were moving anti-aircraft missiles. Um, so, you know, but, but to, to attack the outskirts of, of uh, the capital of Syria and to go after, and this this is very important. Now, the, the, the Syrians are describing this as a research facility. Uh, they yeah, right. attacked a strategic arms depot. In other words, they attacked a chemical depot. Uh, something that is at a strategic level. And uh, that is crossing all kind of red lines. Now, you have to understand, this was done about three hours ago, uh, and it's now quarter after, not qu 10 after 11 p.m. So it's still night uh, in Damascus right. and, and in Israel. So we don't know what's going to happen yet. Right, and uh, it may well be a, a strong asymmetrical response, or they may be deciding right now that uh, it's his time to hit mm. back. Okay, now uh, it, it, put on your military uh, multi-level chess hat and tell us what the most likely responses are from Syria or from Syria and its allies, Russia. What, what's likely to happen on a geopolitical well, let's, let's military? Talk the Russian thing first. The R Russia has elements of four uh, fleets in a major battle fleet right off Syria. It's the largest battle fleet that Russia has assembled since the Second World War. Right. And some of the cruisers are actually battle cruisers. They're not called that. That's one step down from a battleship. They're massive. They're very well armed. Now, I'm a firm believer in the U.S. Navy, don't get me wrong, and its strength, but uh, they didn't send uh, second-string ships. So we've got uh, some really powerful uh, Russian uh, forces there. They also have, um, we saw the last time something happened, they offloaded the Icelander missiles. So we don't know what they've got on some of their ships that they could quickly offload. Uh, one response from Russia could be to fly in several squadrons of the latest Zukov fighters with Russian uh, Russian Air Force planes with Russian pilots. Right, I heard uh, the latest Zukov uh, fight. The latest Zukov that the Russians have developed is more advanced, I'm hearing from my reports, than the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter or the F-22 Raptor. And it well, doesn't have... I don't know about the F-22, but probably the F-35. Yeah, uh, the, well, the reason is the 22 is all kinds of structural problems, including the paint peeling off and going in the jet engines. And uh, so we can't go to its peak velocity. Well, and, the, and the pilots tend to want to pass out. Then. Right, yeah, and the problem is that the turn radius and so on is so high, they get what's called red out or black out, so they end up losing blood flow. And even with their with G suits on, they well, can't survive. Yeah, but yeah, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's the oxygen system, something's wrong with that, figured out. Right, yet. The yeah, F exactly. Can't fly into known uh, electrical systems, you know, uh, thunder thunderstorms. Right, which yeah. means it's got a vulnerability to EMP attacks and. So right, but forth. what I heard is that the Sukhov doesn't have any major structural or operational uh, defects and can operate and is superior to the F-14, which is the standard of the other air forces in the area, including 15. Israel. F-15, F I mean. F-15, and it's, it doesn't have those problems. So you know, looking at it, what are the asymmetric likelihoods? Because the Russians have the best well, it, cruise it, missile. It, it they have the on... best hypersonic cruise missile. They have the best super cavitation hoot uh, torpedo. Uh, the Russians have the best... Uh, the you know, Onyx. And, uh, and Onyx yeah, the, uh, the, yeah. The, they, well, it, the Onyx uh, anti-ship missile is 
probably the best in the world. It's hypersonic. The uh, underwater uh, supersonic uh, rocket torpedo. Uh, it's a rocket. It's underwater rocket. What it is because it creates air around the rocket, so it's not even moving through water. It's moving through air. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's a gas. It's yeah. a gas envelope around the around the torpedo. So no, it's not. Yeah. So it's not even moving through water. It's really uh, pretty yeah, clever. It, it, it has. It it, uh, it has two uh, business ends. The the main thrust out the the tail of the uh, rocket torpedo, but it also has uh, is firing in the front because that's creating a gas bubble that is flying through. Uh, but it, you know, in addition to that, they've got the S-400, which is so far just being used in Russia and uh, Belarus. And that is, without a doubt, the world's most sophisticated air defense system. Uh, they could fly that in very quickly. They could fly in several squadrons of Zhukovs. And remember, they've got their battle, their war fleet offshore. Uh, it depends on what Russia wants to do, and, and that's a, a very strategic. And you can count on the fact that probably decisions are being made as we're speaking. Now, remember, Iran is a player, and Iran has thrown the gauntlet down just in the last few days because all the players knew this was coming, and uh, they've said if you attack Syria, it's an attack on Iran. By the way, but also Pakistan said if you attack Iran, you've attacked Pakistan. And Pakistan, yeah, and has Pakistan the, is nuclear armed. Not only nuclear armed, they have the third largest nuclear weapons manufacturing facility on Earth. Yeah, they, they can kick out 50 hydrogen bombs from one this one factory, and that's, that's not their only factory. Right, so the, the Pakistanis are no slouches, and now that they are in high production, they don't darn well if there's an attack on Syria and Iran. Pakistan and the uh, Waziri province in the north is, is, is target number one, which is why they staged this false attack against uh, Osama bin Laden, to make the Pakistanis think that their airspace and their buildings and their territory is completely vulnerable, when in actual fact they took over someone who's a lookalike. Osama bin Laden died of renal failure years ago, oh, but course. the Pakistanis do not trust the Americans, and for no for good reason, and they certainly don't trust what could happen to Iran, because if Iran's attacked right on their western border, Pakistan is next. Well, we've been by, uh, bribing the Pakistani generals for a long time, but don't forget, Big Brother is really China. They know it. The Chinese know it. Well, the Chinese uh, gave Pakistan uh, f- how was it? Of jet uh, they got almost fifty. Uh, was called JL seventeen uh, jet fighters, which is Ma- a pretty good fighter. Which which is actually a pretty good fighter, but it's, it's the amalgamation of some of the best technology of the F thirty five and F twenty two. Which, by the way, we gave freely to the buggers. I can't believe that we're this stupid. I just can't believe it. But we are. Well, you know, we we have a new war in Mali. And guess who trained the the so-called Mali rebels? Uh, The United uh, States. Oh, my. Yeah, and so we're spending our money, and as we're in a new economic depression, we're spending our money and shipping our boys over and supporting the French who are in active combat against forces that we train. And and it wasn't long ago that the the commander of the rebels was in Washington, D.C., being honored by us. You can't make this stuff up. No, no. The thing is, th- th- this would be a very bad B movie that nobody would go to the theater and they lose money. Well, but they, it actually they, happened. It's silly, it wouldn't happen this way. Well, it is. Yeah. But, but what you what you have unfolding right now, as we speak in the Middle East, is extraordinarily scary. And all we can do is speculate as whether the 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 response will be uh, yeah. soft, whether it will be asymmetrical, or whether it will be an all-out counterattack on Israel. No, uh, something else that I want to throw in here. Do you remember Gerald Bull? Oh yes, I do. Okay, now Gerald Bull's technology was taken away with Russian help, along with all the chemical weapons from uh, from Iraq. Which, by the way, I saw the actual receipts of the advanced weapons from Bethesda sent to Saddam Hussein in the Iraq-Iran War. Uh, well, the those, killed Gerald Bull. Yeah, they killed him. But the thing is, those weapon systems and super uh, ejection systems for firing weapons into space went to Syria. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> Welcome back, and uh, well, Tim, the uh, 
let's go through some of the analysis of what's going on. I just kind of war game it out. We have uh, from yesterday we talked uh, to one of our great guests, Bill Salas, who's on again next Tuesday, and he's looking at the geopolitical analysis of what's happening in Egypt. And Morsi basically is not going to cobble things together. They are in the middle of a very ugly civil war. They also are not likely to honor the treaties with Israel. And to be honest with you, anybody who attacks Israel is committing suicide. Israel will flatten them within minutes. Probably the Mossad, some reports that I've, I've picked up on is, is the Mossad and CIA are are behind a lot of the trouble that's happening in Egypt. Right, but, but it's not just know, them. You, you, it's not you, just you, the Mossad and Egypt. It's not just them. What I'm hearing, because I have Egyptian friends that I talked to in the last few days, and they tell me that they're Christians, and they tell me that the Christians are under such persecution, it's yeah, mind-boggling. I've heard, I've heard from Christians and, and, then, and, and, and then just to secular people, people are just Egyptians. They want to go to university, they want to have a car and a pen that writes, it doesn't skip. They want to have a home where it's safe to go out to go shopping and go to a movie theater and not get blown away. Uh, and the fact is that since this revolution started a few years ago, sponsored by the banks and the, and the people wanting to put in power the Muslim Brotherhood, who have been outlawed for 50 years, right since the time that they assassinated Anwar al-Sadat, the, the fact is that the situation in Egypt is incredibly dangerous. All the Israelis have to do is take in one jet or one missile and blow the high Aswan Dam, and a 100-foot uh, wall of water will sweep down the entire Nile Valley Delta and wipe out 95% of the population within 5 to 10 miles of the delta. And, uh, and, and the Israeli foreign minister, Lieberman, has actually threatened that. Right, and I, that's why I'm quoting it, because Lieberman has basically said, you don't, don't mess with us, Egypt. We'll take you out so quick, you will not even have time to pray well, to Allah. Lieberman was a, a, a gangster, a, a bar well, To be honest with you, you have to talk like that to these Muslims, well, because yeah. they, they, they don't, we may call the Israelis nuts, and they are, but when you're dealing with a nation where whether you're dealing with Israelis or Satanists or just secular agnostics or Christians or they're now Messianics or they're believers in Yeshua, the surrounding Muslim nations want to annihilate all of them. They don't care what version of Israel is. They don't want a nation of Israel to exist in any way, not the size of a postage stamp. Well, yeah, you're, you're right, but you know what? Uh, so, so the only thing I that the Muslim nations understand... Ago when, when there was <clears throat> an encroachment between the Arabs and the <clears throat> Jews, and I, I knew some Palestinians, uh, and they were telling me, you know, well, we're going to go back and everything, and I said, well, don't, you know, keep your powder dry, don't get too excited. Because chances are this this is going to blow yeah, over and, and it's are, not going to be that good. What well, a real simple solution would have been to transfer all of these areas, including one of the solutions that the King of Jordan is talking about, is making the provinces of the territories that the Palestinians have in the West Bank and Gaza just territories or provinces of Jordan. And then the well, problem they solved. Were Jordan. They were Jordanian. Well, but, why, here, but, 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 that but, would solve it. But the problem is... Yeah, dealing Israel, with, could so Israel could make peace with its enemies. Israel has empowered Iran uh, and the other extremists because Israel is still taking air lands. And Israel... Uh, the, War is profit, but here's the other factor. You have the globalist, and you have this super tiny elite of global banking cartel families that are pulling the strings. Israel is their creation. They're pulling Netanyahu's strings. And, you know, remember the letter from uh, the Confederate General uh, Pike uh, that was in the British Museum until uh, one of the Rothschilds got on the board and yanked it. And it, it spoke of three wars in the last uh, war, three world wars, and the last war was be to be between, and they used to use the term, Mohammedans and uh, Christians and, uh, and Jews over the Middle East, and that's where it was to begin. They use wars for profit, right. for expansion of their power, and to reorder society. And, of course, they have multiple population reduction programs going on, like medicine and, yeah. and you know, yeah, and and, and they want to wipe out a big part of the human race because they think there's too many unnecessary eaters, and that means us, by the way, and... Um, well, there was a right, rabbi back in the Second World War that, that there was a rabbi during the Second World War who had uh, the uh, option to go toward the the uh, the rabbinical council and actually propose him with a three million dollar offer to give to the Nazis and they would have let all the Jews go, but he said no, we're not going to give you a cent. So the Jews died in the concentration camps, mainly of disease. It was only in the east where they were being shot. Uh, and, of course, yes, there were death camps, yes, there were mass death camps, but most of it was caused by starvation. Most people don't realize that what well, really happened there... Well, they got disease from the, the, the Russian uh, soldiers. They got, uh, 
Oh, what was that disease? Um, the tick, tick for disease. The, tef- uh, the typhoid. Typhoid spread by ticks. Yeah. yeah. Now, the, the, here's the problem. What we have is a situation now where uh, the fate of Israel is tied directly to America now. <clears throat> and Israel is sitting on at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. And I told this to Hayseed Stevens back in 1999, because I presented this back in June of 99, and then later on he wanted me to go a few months later to Israel at the uh, Yom Teruah, which is the start of the Jewish year. And so I said a prayer at the southwest end of the Dead Sea at the bottom of Mount Sodom, which is a 26,000-foot salt dome, right over literally like a cork over the bottle of the largest abiotic source of oil on Earth. And I told him the amount of oil there was, and this is corroborated by FICO, their engineer from the Israeli oil company, 27.3 trillion barrels of oil, and it was abiotic and renewable. <clears throat> that all of the oil fields in the Middle East literally feel from the mother load there, and that their own engineers calculated that uh, most of the Dead Sea was created by an explosion at the time of Abraham and Lot, where uh, the oil field was struck where the magma that came up along the fault line from Turkey all the way through to Lake Victoria, and when it struck there, it blew a giant hole and was equivalent to 500,000 Hiroshima's. And FICO, who discovered all the oil in the Zohar, which is the town outside of the Dead Sea, the gas fields in Israel, and also discovered all the oil fields in the Sinai Peninsula that the Israelis gave back, he was a senior engineer under Ariel Sharon, and they were presenting, and in fact I've heard lately that Stan Johnson and his group are still pushing from the Prophecy Club to open up those oil fields after Hayseed Stevens died. Now I warned Hayseed Stevens, and I warned Stan Johnson, if they do this, Number one, they will have a very serious, uh, how can I say it, setback of his ministry. Stan Johnson was a prophecy club. And I also warned that Hayseed Stevens, that if he continued to proceed to try to push for this oil to be released right away, that they would hear the sound all the way to Jerusalem of the well drill, and they couldn't stop it from filling up the Dead Sea, and that it would precipitate a massive invasion of millions of troops coming across the Euphrates River to take a spoil because... 95% 95% of the potash on earth, that is for growing food, and literally more than 12 times the world proven oil reserve sits right there at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. They know that. They now discover giant oil and gas fields off of the Israeli coast, just off of Haifa, which is a giant oil refining area. And I happen to actually get the reports of a, and some pipe, are, are, a, pipe, a pipeline from Saudi Arabia right across from Ashdod, from Iliad to Ashdod, paid for by the Saudi Arabian government that's over a 50-inch wide pipeline that was basically never used, put there oh, oh, years oh. ago. Uh, I was going to tell our listeners how they uh, how uh, Gerald Bull's uh, Devices can be made. Yes, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. And Gerald Bull, you, you, what you said, pipeline reminded me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a weapon the size of a when pipeline. We come back. Don't let yeah, you're going to hear things here you've never heard before. But we're literally standing on the precipice of the elements. And I can't say, and we're not setting dates, but when you see the King of Jordan pushing for a peace treaty, when you have Obama with his mandate that he thinks, we see the globalists pushing for the partitioning of the state. We're real close. Uh, two major things you want to talk about. The first is uh, how to build Gerald Bull's super gun. And the second is to this article, February 2nd, 2012, you wrote a conglomeration of articles, War on Iran and Syria, what they are not telling us. And I want you to go through that analysis because it's just as relevant today. And now that we have an inauguration, <laughs> yeah, now we have the inauguration of the so called idiot in chief, which is a shill for the global bankers, who is de- demolishing the economy. Now that we have international foreign policy that shows that he's clearly arming the Al-Qaeda uh, terrorists, uh, and the Benghazi thing has not been dealt with properly yet, and, you know, although we have McCain on both sides, he still criticized the witch uh, Hillary Clinton, who tried to act enraged over this. This is totally a dance out there. Nobody asked the real tough questions and uh, really had a follow-up by the media to deal with the fact that the... The media Benghazi- owned by six companies. They're <clears throat> on Global Zone and right. Zionist Right. 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 So what we have is a situation here where we're heading toward uh, almost certainly a bank holiday sometime this year or next. We're heading uh, toward an expanding war in the Middle East because as this situation gets more unstable, Israel's not going to be able to take out Syria. Yeah, any taking out of Syria means we're going to immediately be at war with Russia. 
Russia means nuclear weapons heading toward a U.S. city. Well, this is a- when I, I kind of uh, skimmed through this uh, article I wrote, it, 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 it's pretty scary. But first, let me talk about Gerald Bull. Yeah, he's an interesting Gerald guy. Gerald Bull was, was the greatest artillery uh, guy that's ever lived. He yeah, was, he was a Canadian. Uh, he, he was a Canadian. And he, you know, we can go back even 500 years to the great artillery systems or 1,000 years. He was the greatest genius in terms of long range, high powered artillery. And his super gun was based on a technology using what's called linear acceleration. Uh, he could literally launch an object the size of a Volvo into space every 30 seconds from a super gun. And he was building these for uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, well, uh, he, he one of the things he started out was uh, the, 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 the standard in the Western armies. Uh, heavy artillery is 155 millimeter, and he took uh, he took that and he he built a 203 millimeter gun system, uh, mechanized, armored and mechanized for Saddam Hussein, and it it, it reached out and touched uh, your enemy much further than 155. <clears throat> right. But but way beyond that was his super gun. Um, now. Uh, what we found, uh, you, you need extreme high tensile steel to be able to fire something like that. And by the way, uh, this is not really new. This was uh, the, the, the Nazis in World War II. They had the V-1, which was a, a primitive cruise missile, the, the V-2, which was a, a primitive uh, ballistic missile, and then they had the V-3. And we bombed the V-3 site before they could get it operational, but it was a super gun. Uh, yeah, the Germans are, were working on the idea of uh, accelerating objects with a little large fuel payload so it could carry a distant uh, chemical, biological, or nuclear uh, weapon yeah, at a great well, distance. Their, their system was different than Gerald's, but right. uh, I've seen the same idea. But yeah, yeah okay, and the idea, now, by the way, this could launch it into near space, meaning hundreds of miles up. So literally, no, there's not a square no. inch of Earth that could be safe from this weapon. This literally weapon could allow you to target anywhere on Earth. Well, uh, what, with, and by what, the way, it wouldn't even have a signature of an infrared signature of a of a launch. So when it and launched, you, you, it. you wouldn't be you able to see it. it. And it would actually accelerate so fast from the ground, you wouldn't have what's called a near launch. For example, when rockets are launching from Russia, the basis for the anti-missile system that they want to place in the Czech Republic or Poland is that they're relatively slow coming off until they get into near space. But these weapons would accelerate out of the end of the cannon at well, we have We have staring satellites that look for, for a thermal signature. You, you wouldn't be able to see it. Red. You wouldn't see it. It would come out literally at, at you know, 17,000. I think there's ways to suppress that. But, okay, here, yeah. here's, the, here's the deal with Gerald Bull. Uh, what Saddam did is he took oil pipeline pipes, which are very strong, but nowhere near as strong as what you need for a super gun. And then they took steel cables, fairly thick steel cables, <laughs> you know, uh, oh, maybe an inch thick, made them hot and wrapped them around that piping multiple times. Uh, kind of, a, to draw an analogy, kind of like plywood. You know, plywood, you have multiple layers running in different directions, and it's, it, it's, uh, it, you end up with a fairly strong piece of wood that uh, is made of uh, sometimes junk wood, but it's, it, it runs in different you know, layers, and, and it really adds a lot of strength. That's also how they make bulletproof uh, Lexan, is they build up different layers. Okay, now, he did that, and, and they were able to, uh, to rel- relatively cheaply build some, in, in place, build some uh, very powerful uh, weapon systems, but uh, they were overrun. Now, you can build these things, and you can do it in secret if you know what you're doing, and you don't use anything like that unless and until the balloon goes up. And right now, we're about a second to midnight uh, in terms of World War III and a general Middle Eastern war in Europe. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. It means we're awful, uh, awful close. You've got a couple quick questions, geopolitical. On which side will Turkey fall? Ah, uh, you know what? Uh, Turkey, uh, just the latest reports is they're thinking about joining the the uh, uh, the Russian Chinese thing because they still haven't been let into the EU. Well, what I hear is that you go back to the Bible. It says Tokamar of the North parts. Tokamar of the North parts is Turkey. So if you look at the table of nations from Ezekiel thirty-eight and thirty-nine, they're not part of Europe. They're part of the alliance. And remember now, what Russia is talking about with the Europeans is a Euro-Russian uh, super empire. 
And that means that the only way that, that Europe will be rescued uh, geopolitically and financially from military disasters is they amalgamate with Russia. And Russia is a leader, as it says in Ezekiel, of all the Muslim nations. Every Muslim nation is completely dependent, as it says, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech, Tubal, and Rosh, which is in the ancient Hebrew, Russia. And they sing this song called the Gil- Vilna Gayan on the top of Masada when they give the pilots in Israel their, their wings. And that song basically says when the, when Rush crosses from the Bosporus to the Mediterranean, put on your Shabbat or Sabbath clothes because Messiah HaMashiach is coming. They know Messiah is coming. They think it's for the first time, but in fact it's coming for the second time because it's the time of Jacob's trouble. And this song is 2,800 years old. goes right back to Ezekiel. Yeah. Um, it's very... Very, very, very time. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been having panic attacks since last July, and there's times where it gets overwhelming. I, mean, I had a friend ask me, "Do you get upset by going on the radio?" No, I get upset about the stuff I have to talk about because well, that, this, we're not that, making this up. This is like this is Panic City time. You know, when well, they say know, like in the Comedy Central, friends, yeah. I, I, Bill, most of my friends will not go to my blog. Uh, my pastor's wife said uh, I, she she used to read, but she said I want to sleep at night. Well, well I, I have relatives that won't do that either. They think either you're nuts, and they don't even want to have a dialogue because if you can prove to them that you're not crazy and that maybe you actually have two clues or there's evidence or it's in the regular media, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it because... Well, it's just very scary. I mean, you can stay focused on things like Second Amendment rights and the, the stupid issue that Obama... First off, if Obama wanted to take away the guns, he'd have to have an executive order that could be overridden by the Congress and Senate. It would end up being overridden by the Supreme Court. I mean, he had no chance whatsoever unless he wanted to market guns and make sure... Well, that's an interesting diversion as we're heading into it. Right, and I think also it's maybe also to scare the crap out of the Chinese because the Chinese are in Venezuela and in Mexico and they're just itching to invade America. This may be a reality check for them to say, you stupid Chinese, you are not going to invade America. If you do, we'll kill you so quick you can't even yes, imagine but now it. now Obama is talking about cutting the, the our air defense system uh, on the Mexican border down. Well, you know what I think is going to happen? I think it's almost like a dialectic. Uh, when he's talking about cutting the air defense systems, which is a cause major protests, Congress and Senate are going to have something to do with it. And I really think that Obama is on a very short tether. He's going to end up getting impeached very quickly after his inauguration. I think this man is going to have a very short second term. Well, you know, it, 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 it's all, time will tell. Well, well, I think you're going to have three things happen. First off, the reason why the Republicans won't do anything is because John Bonner is a crying alligator. Once they uh, sweep a Bonner out of the way, and he actually is, and the conservative elements of the Republican Party take over, and the Democrats are blue dog Democrats. We talked about this in the first hour. There's at least six Democratic senators that their necks on the chopping block in less than two years. And that includes, by the way, Harry Reid. All in districts where if they vote against guns, they're finished. They're finished. That means a major true. swing, major swing back to the Republicans uh, will take I don't the Senate. Think Congress is going to pass major gun control. Not, not in, not in your life. Not in the Senate. Forget it. Not going to happen. I remember yeah, when yeah, I think so. Tim, let's uh, get back in some of this yeah, analysis. I, I, we have a segment in the remaining for... time. I, I want to cover uh, this article: uh, "War on Iran in Syria." What they are not telling us. Yeah, let's do it. And I, I'm going to run through it here quickly. Uh, if we were about to launch a massive uh, attack and wage war on nuclear armed Russia and China, there would be mass fear, panic, and widespread knowledge that the end would be upon most of us, that the resulting counterstrike from the Russian and Chinese nuclear forces would kill most of us. Uh, however, we're rapidly approaching a war with Iran uh, and, of course, Syria, a nation that can deliver the same level of death. Or worse. A, or worse. People have to understand worse, right, the advanced bioprep weapons, and I just want to describe it because I have scientists. I trained under a bioweapon here from Bethesda back in the early 70s, and I can tell you from scientists who visited the facility north of Moscow, 240 40 kilometers. That's a city of 240,000 technicians and scientists, and additionally their families. One bioreactor in one building was three stories high. 
that's that's insane. Yeah, and so people need to understand these are not weapons like we. Eighty five percent of our budget now is making nice, cute biological weapons that are mycotoxins. You hit it with an area, kills everybody, or paralyzes so they suffocate, and it's gone in a few hours, and you're fine. No, no, what the Russians did back in the forties, fifties, sixties, and seventies, etc., is they built weapons that are the most advanced bioweapons on Earth. By the way, they have the most advanced biological weapons protection suit on Earth, and they put in a unbelievable amount of energy into developing these weapons, and they transferred virtually all of them when the collapse of the Soviet Union occurred under uh, under their drunken president at the time, who drank too much vodka. They ended up not even able to buy borscht or sausage. The Iranians and Syrians were smart. They literally bought these scientists who walked out the door with the most advanced vials of the most deadly weapons ever conceived in human history and literally brought them to Tehran and to, and to Damascus, Syria. Yeah, they and, and literally, uh, while most of us in the world are us, but most of the countries in the world see this as, as, as I call it biochemical warfare, biologically produced toxins, right. which are which are longer and persistent than yeah, chemical they're... warfare, but but still they. they by, by the by the way, yeah. one of the most deadly weapons, and I want to mention this because we have World War Z coming here with Brad Pitt this summer. The most advanced, one of the most advanced weapons is what's called a zombie weapon. And it is a version of a virus like rabies that eats the cortex of the brain and, de- and makes you decorticate. Oh, well, how wonderful. Yeah, and it does it in a matter of hours. So what happens is if you get this, uh, you basically become a decorticate zombie, so you're literally the living dead. You no longer have a cortex, uh, and, but you're not dead. You still have a heartbeat pulse. You still can see and do other things, but you're becoming decorticate. And, of course, the first area is to go to the frontal lobe, so you end up becoming a decorticate zombie. This is the kind of weapon we're talking about. We're talking about weapons that are so beyond the pale. They take snippets of DNA from a wide variety of viruses and put them together and create viruses that have never well, existed. Ex- exactly. The in one that the, I remember sitting at a, at a, uh, in a bar in Halifax, Nova Scotia, with my... Professor Dr. Robert Brown literally was crying across the table after having a couple beers and a steak and told me that he managed to be sick one day with the flu in 1971 uh, in Rutgers campus where they had an offshore Bethesda project at a class 4 facility where the T-virus got out and it was a recombinant between an injector core and a virus that would cause neuromuscular paralysis and one canister of a kilogram at 40,000 feet over the Boston to Washington corridor would kill everyone in there within a matter of hours from suffocation. They literally suffocate because it could be been into paralysis and couldn't breathe. And he said what happened is the virus got out of containment that day that he was sick, first day in years. And everyone, all of his colleagues, got incinerated at 2,000 degrees and foamed. And, uh, you know, people don't understand. The backup safety features kicked in. Right, the backup safety features. So you got to understand that these weapon systems that have been developed, they're not gone. Uh, and the Russian systems were transferred over to to Tehran and, and Syria, and to, by the way, Saddam Hussein, who also had access to our Bethesda, Maryland facilities, and to our bioweapons. In he fact, had, he had some, but the, it was yeah, the Iranians that really invested. Right, but he, but he had he had access to he had, he, had, he got invested. access. I'll tell you one thing: he was doing, believe it or not, he actually was taking gerbils and taking a weaponized form of Ebola our weaponized version of Ebola and literally infecting gerbils, then dropping them in liquid nitrogen, grinding them down to powder and putting them in, in we call these model airplanes up to six feet across that could fly into radar and drop a spray of the weaponized Ebola over troops or etc. He was doing this back in the, uh, during his time of the Iran-Iraq war and was threatening to use these weapons. Do you realize that that is relatively <clears throat> simple technology compared to a lot of this stuff? Yeah, simple. Yeah, all he had to do was have access. I saw the actual receipts from the uh, delivery, uh, the FedEx delivery to uh, Saddam well, Hussein. Well, here's my point, and I, and I, I want to get back to this real quick to, yeah. to cover it. Look, the level of death that can be inflicted on the American homeland and can the Canadian homeland and the Eastern and Western and Central European homelands, as well as the Middle East, by Iran and to a lesser extent Syria, is literally greater than had they if they had thousands of nuclear warheads. Right. The point is, the only reason why because they don't want to people. It is because blow up buildings, but mo- mo- people. Mo- most people in Iran are young people under 30, and they want to buy our CDs and genes, and they want to go to U.S. universities. Absolutely. Uh, the reason why the mullahs are in power is because we persecuted the heck out of the Iranians, so the mullahs maintain power because we persecute them. Well, that's kind of what 
I say about uh, uh, a lot of the stuff that Israel does. They create their own problems. Exactly. So, But what we're doing is they're sitting on all these horrifying weapons, but if we push them too far, they're going to use them. Well, that's the point. You see, they, we are talking about a mass, <clears throat> mutually assured destruction weapon, and and it's it's an Armageddon weapon. It's 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 uh, this is what you use when your back is up against the wall. You're staring death in the face. This is the button you press because this takes out the guy that's about to kill you. Right. And uh, right. that that's human nature. Okay, but we are are dealing with. Nations. We're not dealing with uh, Gaddafi in Libya. We're dealing with a nation, particularly Iran and to a lesser extent Syria, that have the military technology to <clears throat> cause two thirds of Americans, I mean us, men, women, and children right here in America, to die. Yeah, exactly. Now, the point is this. We don't have a leader. We have a politician in the White House. We don't have leadership in the Congress or Senate either. We have a bunch of fools trying to cover their ass. We and have a bunch main... of political horses. So right. They want to maintain their position as Speaker of the House, or they, they want to get reelected like even these idiots like, uh, like Reed that want to be reelected as a senator when it comes up in two years' time. And By the way, the six senators are all in districts where all their constituents support gun use. And even Mr. Reed from uh, Arizona, he's very unlikely to be reelected. He's very unlikely to get reelected uh, if he ever tries to, to push for an Obama-style gun seizure. It's just not going to happen. And the very first home that these stupid police officers and SWAT teams try to SWAT and they kill a veteran, especially because they're going to go after the vets first, those guys, the half-life of these SWAT team officers, their families, and those police officers will be like a ham sandwich among a bunch of Rottweilers. They won't there's have. A, uh, there's a there's an interesting article. I have it on my blog today. Uh, it's from Veterans Today, right? Uh, and it's titled "American America After Sandy Hook: Disarmed and Silenced." And the thrust, uh, the, the the article has many many good aspects to it. But one of the, the the thrust of it is, we are now so focused on the issue of gun control and taking our guns away and so forth, we've kind of lost sight of other things. And while we're focused on that, that's this, on purpose. That's on purpose because this is a huge distraction. Obama knew he had no chance, like a snowball in hell's chance, of getting this done. Uh, he doesn't deal with the fact that we're having a collapse of the banking system in Europe which we talked about in hour one with Harley Schlanger, we are literally moments away from a European economic collapse and a almost certain bank holiday here in America. In the next two years, a, I would say a 75 to 80% chance of a CME knocking out the power grid in the Northern Hemisphere and nothing's being done about it. You can look at the CIA special called Sunstorm on, on DirecTV or if you want to just pull it up yourself online, you can realize that we're doing nothing to deal with space weather near comets. On my birthday, 197 Kilometer, uh, sorry, a meter comet's going to whip past the Earth at under 100,000 miles, some say as low as 5,000 miles off the surface. We have a giant tail that we're going to pass through the very shortly as well of a but comet none S. None of that may be important if we manage to blow this little planet. Exactly. Apart. In other words, the things that we're doing in mankind, I think is more dangerous than any of the space weather that could happen. But I would say, in order of importance, I'd say number one, we're doing much more than even the danger of our near space objects and the danger of a CME. Folks, uh, it, this is really a good time to get right with God. Yeah, exactly. I'll tell you how I deal with my panic attacks is I pray that I can deal with the content I have to talk about every day. And don't think we're just doing this. We're not here to entertain you. We're here to convince you to get face down, to pray, to prepare, and uh, to take it seriously. Don't just attack the, the messenger. Way, folks, today's a good day to buy gasoline. Uh, if this, We don't know where this attack overnight uh, is going to go. But if it gets big, you won't be able to afford gas. Uh, in other words, get a full tank. <laughs> yep. You're a comedian, too. Back tomorrow with Tim on Hour 3 tomorrow. Hour 1, Dr. Gary Reidenauer, an update on the flu epidemic about to be a pandemic.